Um, when King Henry VIII chose to separate himself from the jurisdiction of the See of Rome and to assume the spiritual powers belonging to the papacy, it became necessary to emphasize the antiquity and splendor of the British monarchy. The preamble of one such act of Parliament declared, where by divers sundry old authentic histories and chronicles, it is manifestly declared and expressed that this realm of England is an empire and so hath been accepted in the world, governed by one supreme head and king, having the dignity and royal estate of the imperial crown of the same. Although the king and his advisers would draw on dubious chronicles, hagiographies and genealogies, as well as Arthurian and Constantinian legend, to support his position, there is a continuous tradition in support of his claim, which can be traced back long before the Norman conquest. It's my purpose in this paper to gather up the evidence and pointers of this imperial theme and to see what it tells us about Britain and the early church. Traditionally, the Roman world was viewed as tripartite, divided into the three great continents of Europa, Africa and Asia. Britain, as befitted its geographical situation beyond the edge, was an outer orbis, another world, the classical equivalent of the dark continent in the 19th century, or the moon or Mars to us. The two invasions of Julius Caesar in 55 and 54 BC in the course of his Gallic Wars resulted in no territory being annexed to Rome, but might be regarded as a political statement more akin to President Kennedy's promise to put a man on the moon within the decade. When Caesar departed, the indigenous tribes and their chieftains were linked to Rome by treaty, Cunobelinus, chieftain of the Catavolonae, controlled a substantial portion of southeast Britain and is called King of the Britons, Britannorum Rex, by Suetonius. And the Emperor Claudius eventually conquered southern Britain, which became a part of the Roman Empire in 43 AD. In their unsuccessful struggle with Rome, resistance leaders such as Caractacus, Boudica, and Calgarchus laid the foundations of a native consciousness of Britishness. For four, four centuries, Britain was an integral part of the Roman Empire, and for the last hundred years of that association, it was an Orthodox Christian Empire to which it belonged. Historians differ about the significance of that link once Britain became independent of imperial oversight. I will examine the nature of that relationship from the perspective of British Christianity and attempt to discover whether Romanitas, of which we've heard quite a lot today, what it meant to be a Roman, in one form or another, had any continuing significance for Britain and for Christianity here. For the urbane Romans, who were dispatched as governors to this remote province, it was the equivalent of the northwest frontier during the British Raj, where rising Roman generals and emperors like Vespasian and Titus often cut their teeth. Tacitus, writing of his father-in-law Agricola, who served three terms in Britain, the last as governor, spoke of a people living in isolation and ignorance. In the patristic age, the fact that the gospel message had taken root in such remote regions was a proof of its power, happily exploited by Christian apologists. Tertullian, at the beginning of the third century, wrote, of all the limits of the, of the Spains and the diverse natures of, nations of the Gauls and the haunts of the Britons, inaccessible to the Romans, but subjugated to Christ. And Oregon, another great third century Christian apologist, saw the conversion of Britain as evidence of the universality of the Christian message. He said, the divine goodness of our Lord and Saviour is equally diffused among the Britons, the Africans, and other nations of the world. And also he said, the grace of our Lord and Saviour is ever with those who are cut off from our world in Britain, and with those who are in Mauritania, and with all under the sun who believed in his name. See therefore the goodness of the Saviour, how it has spread over the whole world. And as late as the early 5th century, we find St. John Chrysostom boasting, even the British Isles, which lie outside the boundaries of our world and sea, in the midst of the ocean itself, have experienced the power of the word, for even there churches and altars have been set up. The 6th century Greek historian Procopius of Caesarea writes a rather confused account of Britannia, or Britia, 
but mentions the Roman government's inability to control it after the usurpation of Constantine III, since when it had remained in the hands of local dynasts or tyrants. He concludes the chapter on Britain with a ghost story that details the ferrying over to Britia every night of the souls of the dead by fishermen in inhabiting the adjacent coast of the mainland, probably a garbled version of an ancient British myth, rather like the mythical Isle of Avalon, to which the dying King Arthur was rowed after his battle with Mordred. Similarly, Plutarch located the sleeping Cronus, patriarch and ruler of the Golden Age, imprisoned by his son Zeus on an island near to Britain. For over two centuries, Britannia was ruled by the emperor in Rome. Between 260 and 274, the Roman provinces of Gaul, Britannia and Hispania seceded to form a Gallic Empire originally ruled from Cologne. Early in 287, Carausius, commander of the Classis Britannica, the English Channel Fleet, declared himself Emperor of Britain and Northern Gaul. He drew support from British dissatisfaction with Roman rule and had coins minted declaring himself restorer of Britain and spirit of Britain and depicting himself alongside the emperors Diocletian and Maximian as co-Augusti. Constantius I, Chlorus, appointed Caesar, reclaimed the lost provinces for the empire in 293 and Carausus was assassinated by his treasurer, Electus, who promptly proclaimed himself emperor, an office he held for less than three years until he was himself defeated and killed by the troops of Constantius. In the tradition of numismatic propaganda, Constantius duly issued a medallion in 296 bearing the slogan, Restorer of the Eternal Light, a clear reference to the luminous benefits of imperial Roman rule. Britain may have been geographically remote, but its links with the Roman and later Byzantine Empire are significant, and we might do well to remind ourselves that it was in the city of York in July 306, following the death of his father Constantius, that Constantine the Great was first proclaimed emperor. As the Roman Empire began its long decline and fall, we see the rise of several more usurping British emperors, all of whom were Christian. Magnus Maximus was a native of Hispania, but he served under Count Theodosius in Britain around 368, and in 380 was appointed Count of the Britons and defeated the Picts and Scots um, in 383. Proclaimed emperor by his troops, he gathered a very large army of Britons, neighbouring Gauls, Celts and the tribes thereabout, and crossed over into Gaul, where he defeated the Emperor Gracian, who was killed in flight. Although allegedly baptised just before his proclamation as emperor, Maximus became a scourge of heretics, and Gibbon notes he is distinguished as the first among the Christian princes who shed the blood of his Christian subjects on account of their religious opinions. In 385 at Trier, he sentenced Priscillian, Bishop of Avila, and his companions to death, whilst his followers, the poet Latrionius, was exiled to the Isles of Scilly. The subsequent defeat and execution of Maximus enabled the dispatch of a legion under General Stilicho, the imperial regent, and his defeat of the Picts in 398. When a combined force of barbarians overran Gaul in 406, the British responded by electing their own emperors. They were short-lived successors to Maximus. Marcus, the military commander, and Gratianus, a civilian official, each enjoyed the imperial dignity for only a few months before being murdered for failing to please their supporters. Their successor, Constantine III, a common but able soldier, chosen perhaps because of his name and its association with Constantine the Great, ruled from the spring of 407 until September 411. He immediately crossed the Gaul where he defeated some of the barbarian raiders and probably came to an accommodation with the remainder whereby they agreed spheres of influence. Hoping to establish his own dynasty, Constantine called upon his eldest son Constans, who had taken monastic vows, to leave his cloister and join him in Arles, which he had made his capital. The former monk was proclaimed as Caesar, found a wife, and given the task of subduing Spain, in which he succeeded. 
Even the Emperor Honorius was obliged to recognize Constantine as co-emperor. However, these successes were short-lived. Perhaps angry at his abandonment, the Britons revolted and expelled Constantine's tax collectors and officials. Constance was put to death when Vienne was captured in 211, and either out of piety, or perhaps in an attempt to preserve his life, Constantine sought ordination to the priesthood before formally abdicating and surrendering arms to the Emperor Honorius his emissaries. Having received the promise that his life would be spared, he and his younger son Julianus were sent under guard to Ravenna, but 30 miles outside the city, they were both executed as usurpers. Although accused by Gildas writing about 540 of having denuded Britain of troops, early Welsh genealogies give Maximus, referred to as Maxon or Maxim Vledic, as the ancestor of the dynasties of several medieval Welsh kingdoms, including those of Powys and Gwent. The pillar of Elisek in Denbyshire, erected by Simon Ap Cadell, King of Powys, who died in 855, to commemorate his great grandfather Elisek, claims descent from Britu, son of Severa, the daughter, daughter of Maximus the King, who killed the King of the Romans. Indeed, Maximus has long held a position of supreme importance in Welsh legendary history as the last of the Roman emperors to rule Britain, who came to be identified as the first ruler of an independent Britain from whom all legitimate power flowed, the founder of the Celtic Kingdom of the West and so ultimately of the Welsh nation. A Christian empire and Christian emperors presupposes a Christian establishment in which the bishops and priests played a significant role. The Cairo emblem now became more than a simple religious symbol and doubled up as an emblem of the imperial Constantinian dynasty and their successors. Dr. David Petz of Durham University suggests the possibility that the church may have controlled metal production he posits the theory that the church could have been granted control over elements of mineral extraction in Britain and offers the salt pan discovered at Shevington in Cheshire with its inscription referring to a possible Bishop of Chester, Viventi Episcopi, in support of this hypothesis. Betts also considers the combined evidence of ingots, coinage, seal rings, belt buckles and even shields all bearing either the Cairo or other distinctive Christian symbols as evidence that in the late Roman period, the state was interested in projecting a Christian image closely binding the church and empire together. He says, this appearance of obvious Christian symbols and objects carried or worn by the representatives of the Roman state would have sent a powerful signal. The names of very few British bishops of this period have come down to us. We have the names of three bishops who attended a provincial council at Arles in 314, perhaps representing the capitals of three out of the four provinces into which Britain was then divided. We know that the Council of Ariminium, Rimini, in 359, when many bishops were present, as we'd heard earlier, three only from Britain claimed imperial funds to finance their travel and accommodation. And an analysis of the phrasing of this report has been taken to imply that the British delegation contained many more than the three who incited comment. St. Patrick, as we heard again, writing towards the end of the 5th century, was the son of a deacon, Calpurnius, who was also a Decurian, a town councillor, and that Patrick's grandfather, Petitus, was a priest. As the office of Decurian tended to be hereditary, it's likely that the grandfather had also held it, and the great majority of clergy were indeed drawn from the class of city councillors. One of the early acts of the Emperor Constantine had been to grant exemption to Christian clergy from serving on town councils, the duties of which were often heavy and could prove an expensive burden. His purpose was to free the clergy to give their full attention to their spiritual duties, but the actual effect was an instant rush of city councillors and their families into holy orders in an effort to avoid the financial risks. As one of the duties of councillors was to collect taxation, they were not always held in the highest regard and often seen as cruelly oppressive in their exactions. There's a clear suggestion in St. Patrick's writings, and again in Gildas, that whilst 5th century Britain may have been Christian in name, it was worldly in spirit. This worldliness was in some measure due to the fact 
that Christianity was not only socially acceptable, but enjoyed a privileged status as an accepted part of the establishment. The few surviving mosaics and silver hoards suggest links with landed gentry, the very class who would, been who would have been influential when imperial rule ended. So Patrick accepts his early captivity as a punishment for his sin. His fate was shared by thousands like him. He says, we drew away from God and did not keep his commandments and did not obey our priests who kept reminding us of our salvation. If Patrick did not openly condemn the British bishops, he may nevertheless have been wounded by their hostility. It may be to them whom he characterises as little masters of rhetoric, a diminutive of contempt. He felt that they despised him and believed him unworthy of the episcopate, that they regarded him as a stranger whose words carried no weight, that they misconstrued his motives and object objected to his rusticity. When St. Germanus of Auxerre and Bishop Lupus were sent to Britain by the Gallican bishops to combat the Pelagian heresy, which had taken hold in Britain, the leading teachers of the heresy, we're told, came forth flaunting their wealth in dazzling robes surrounded by a crowd of flatterers. What is interesting is that no mention is made of any British bishops during their visit. E. A. Thompson comments, I'm tempted to think that the bishops, or the bishop of the region of Britain in question, had joined the heretics, and that Constantius, who wrote about this, thought it discreet to suppress the fact it would reflect no credit on the church. This would be supported by Prosper of Aquitaine's reference to the fact that Agricola, a Pelagian, the son of the Pelagian bishop Severianus, corrupted the British churches by the insinuation of his doctrine. Christianity and patriotism became synonymous in the struggle with Pictish invaders and Germanic and Irish immigrants. St. Patrick considered himself and all other Britons to be Roman citizens, although the last Roman troops had left the island in the year 410. When Patrick attacks the British warlord Caroticus, who would also have regarded himself as Roman, calling him a tyrant for sending soldiers to kill neophyte Christians and carrying off others into captivity, he refuses to recognise them as fellow citizens, or even as fellow citizens of the Holy Romans, but prefers to call them fellow citizens of the demons, not because of their, just because of their evil actions, but because he was not behaving in the Roman manner. Romanitas in the 5th century is a cultural concept which embraces Orthodox Christianity as opposed to barbarian paganism or heresy. Literacy in Latin, the only necessary conduit for both Christian worship and teaching, as well as civilised discourse, and civil law and order, as opposed to the anarchy of warlords and slave raiders. The idea of the continuity of British Romano-Christian culture into the 6th century has found support from archaeologists. Dr. Ken Dark, author of Civitas to Kingdom and Britain and the End of the Roman Empire, suggests that a sub-Roman or late antique society survived in the West and North of Britain during the 5th and 6th centuries. He says, in those, these areas there is absolutely no reason to assume that major cultural disruption occurred due to political strife or warfare in the 5th century. And all the archaeological and textual indications suggest widespread cultural continuity from the 4th to 6th centuries. He cites the classic excavations for the late Philip Barker at Roxeter, the adjacent site of the legionary fortress dug by Graham Webster showing sub-Roman activity, Dr. Hilary Cole's seminal study of the latest dated Roman Romano-British artefacts, and more recently, the new excavations at Bantham. Late Roman patterns, even commercial activity at the centre of the former Kivitas capital, seems to provide evidence suggesting that much of the late Roman past survived in 5th and 6th century Western and Northern Britain, although doubtless much too had changed. It was a sub-Roman, or more correctly, late antique society, i.e. one in the mainstream of late antiquity, not simply a late Roman one. Writing around 540 and reviewing the past two centuries of history, Gildas, as we've heard, like a new Jeremiah, bemoaned the loss of a post-Roman Britain that had fallen into ruin. 
The rulers of Britain, although kings, are tyrants. That signifies a lack of legitimacy, not cruelty or des despotism. And their rule is unfavourably contrasted with Roman authority. He says, ever since it was first inhabited, Britain has been ungratefully rebelling, stiff-necked and haughty, now against God, now against its own countrymen, sometimes even against kings from abroad and their subjects. And similarly, he dismisses the priests as fools in a scathing attack worthy of an Old Testament prophet. He lambasts them as rapacious wolves. He says, fresh from their wicked dealings, many, rather than being drawn into the priesthood, rush into it or spend almost any price on attaining it. There they remain in the same old unhappy slime of intolerable sin, even after they have obtained a priestly seat of bishop or presbyter. They never sit in it, but wallow there disgracefully like pigs. They have grubbed and grabbed merely the name of a priest, not the priestly way of life. They have received the apostolic dignity without it being suitable, it's suitable for entire faith and penitence for evil. However, the one sin of which Gildas never accuses his fellow countrymen is paganism. For much of Western Europe, the Roman Imperium did not entirely disappear, but was represented in spirit by the Roman Church, which not only filled the gap in authority left by the Western Roman Emperors, but also assumed the mantle of Romanitas. During the pontificate of Pope Leo I the Great, we see the seeds sown of a more developed view of Petrine supremacy and the universal ju jurisdiction of the See of Rome. For him, the Roman Empire was the vehicle by which all peoples might be drawn into a church and state working towards a common goal. He said divine providence fashioned the Roman Empire, the growth of which was extended to boundaries so wide that all races everywhere became next door neighbours. For it was particularly germane to the divine scheme that many kingdoms should be bound together under a single government and that the worldwide preaching should have a swift means of access to all people over whom the role of a single state held sway. Leo also regarded the spread of Christianity beyond the empire as demonstrating the superiority of Christian over pagan Rome. The Roman Empire was designed by God so that its frontier should be contiguous with all the nations of the earth and brought all nations under its rule so as to facilitate their conversion to the faith. Under his predecessor, Celestine I, the mission headed by Bishop Lagos had been sent to the Irish believing in Christ, and he was followed by Patrick, a native Briton. Ireland had never been part of the Roman Empire, but now became part of the Church's Imperium. Pope Leo proudly asserts that the authority of Christian Rome had surpassed the farthest boundaries limiting the power of Imperial Rome. He said, these men, Peter and Paul, are the ones who promoted you, Rome, to such glory as a holy race, the chosen people, a priestly and the royal city, and having been made the head of the whole world through their ho the holy see of the blessed Peter, you came to rule over a wider territory for the worship of God and by earthly domination. For although you were exalted by many victories and thereby extended the authority of your empire by land and by sea, nevertheless what the toils were subjected to you is less than that which in you Christian peace has made obedient. Professor Thomas Charles Edwards suggests that Leo was clearly alluding to the mission to the Irish. He reminds us that the consecration of the bishop by the Pope for the Irish was directly relevant to the 28th canon of the Council of Chalcedon and to papal relations both with the Eastern Empire and the See of Constantinople. In addition, one of the main impulses behind the theoretical elaboration of the papal primacy was fear of imperial domination, whereby the authority of the Bishop of Rome might appear to be based solely on powers conferred by imperial decree and the Pope to be just another imperial officer. Uh, Charles, Professor Charles Edwards says the activities of Germanus and of Pelagius in Britain and in Ireland demonstrated that Christian and papal Rome, the Roman Peter and Paul, could intervene to safeguard and to spread the faith in an island which had thrown off imperial authority and also in another island which had never been subject to the sway of the emperor. The Christian faith and the authority of Christian Rome extended not only to Roman citizens, but just to Parthians, Medes and Elamites, but to rebellious Britons and even to the barbarous Irish. 
Those who oppose Rome's hegemony over kings and emperors, or papo Caesarism, have asserted that in the West, this was always a greater danger than its opposite, Caesaropapism. Because while the Western Empire had collapsed after 476 and split up into a number of independent kingdoms, the Western Church remained united, making her by far the most prominent survivor of Christian Romaninity. Even the most powerful of the Western kings did not command a territory greater than that of a Roman provincial governor, which is what they had been in some cases, whereas the Pope was not only the undisputed leader of the whole of Western Christendom, but also the senior hierarch in the whole of the church, eastern and western. Towards the end of Pope Leo's pontificate, communication between Rome and the British Isles became increasingly tenuous. Despairing of the empire's ability to offer protection, the British had grasped de facto sovereignty. The historian Zosimus explains, thus happened this revolt or defection of Britain and the Celtic nations when Constantine usurped the empire by whose negligent government the barbarians were emboldened to commit such devastations. The rescript of the Emperor Honorius effectively granted de jure independence from Rome. The Zosimus Act adds, Honorius sent letters to the cities of Britain, counselling them to be watchful of their own security. In other words, get on and look after yourselves. The mission of St. Germanus and his attempt to eradicate Pelagianism in the immediate aftermath of independence, by contrast, represents the ability of the Roman See to intervene for the good of the Church of Britain when the Empire was unable to do anything. In neighbouring Gaul, we find this same desire to cling to the vestiges of Romanitas as a proof of civilization and legitimacy. As the Franks overran Roman Gaul, Saegrius, the last Roman magister militum per Gallius, maintained a diminishing kingdom centred on Soissons between the Somme and the Loire. The historian Gregory of Tours calls him Rex Romanorum. His defeat by the sailing Frankish king Clovis in 486 or 487 at the Battle of Soissons and his later assassination has been seen by some as the loss of the last vestige of the Roman Empire in the west, outside of Italy. But the new order which replaced him actually sought legitimacy by appropriating to itself the stars and symbols of the imperium it had overthrown. Somebody writes, it's a chap called Vladimir Moss, who's an orthodox. He says, Roman entity, it was felt, could be bestowed on the Western barbarian kingdoms that arose out of the rubble that was the Western Empire by the Eastern Emperor's gift of regalia, or high Roman rank, usually not the imperial rank, however, on their kings. Thus, St. Gregory of Tours writes of Clovis, the first Christian king of the Franks, that he received letters from the Emperor Anastasius to confer the consulate on him. In St. Martin's church, he stood clad in a purple tunic and the military mantle, and he crowned himself with a diadem. He then rose out on his horse, and with his own hand showered gold and silver coins among the people, present all the way from the doorway of St. Martin's church to Tours Cathedral. And from that day on, he was called Consul, or Augustus. What began as barbarian invasions of Britain soon led to settlement, and eventually the hegemony of the Angles, Saxons and Jutes, who established their own kingdoms, Kent, East Anglia, Deira, Wessex and Mercia. An earlier Brythonic kingdom in the territory of the Votidini seems to have fallen to the Angles in the north, who consolidated it as the kingdom of Benicia. In the intervening years, Britain's separation from the vestiges of empire became more pronounced, as the Saxon incursion was consolidated. But the Roman See, having in the meantime converted the Franks to Christianity, now had an entrance into the Saxon kingdom of Kent when the pagan king Ethelbert was married to a Christian Frankish princess. The Augustinian mission which Pope Gregory the Great sent to Kent in 597 owed much to Gregory's sense of the Roman Imperium. His biographer, Geoffrey Richards, in examining Gregory's worldview suggests that his Romanitas came only second to his Christianitas, his commitment to his faith. His devotion to the empire and the emperor were parallel to Christendom. The Christian imperium, both divinely ordained, but with essentially different, if complementary, spheres of influence. England was a remote country of which he knew relatively little, but he knew it had been a former Roman 
imperial province overrun by Germanic tribes a century and a half earlier. Charles Edwards contends that Gregory's plan was not merely to the English, but to the whole of mainland Britain. Augustine was given authority over the British bishops, as well as authority to erect two metropolitan sees in London and in York. He says, Gregory may have known very little about contemporary British Christians, but he was clear that he wished to restore a Christian Britain, making full use of British bishops under the authority of his personal envoy, Augustine. The initial stimulus may therefore have been approaches by Ethelbert of Kent to his wife's people, the Franks, which came to nothing in the short term, but the task was taken up perhaps through communication between Burgundy and Rome, and as his mind gave shape to his schemes of conversion, Gregory turned more and more to the past, to Leo the Great, to a late Roman and Christian Britain, and perhaps even to the Chronicle of Prosper, written largely in Rome, which would have told him of another papal initiative in converting the barbarian beyond the ocean. Bede's history, an account of the conversion and progress of the English nation, is infused with the spirit of Romanitas. The late Professor Wallace Hadrill comments on Bede's handling of the pre-Gregorian British church. He says his Romano-British history also exhibits a great preliminary national disaster in the face of divine displeasure. The Romano-British had had their own ecclesiastical history, and it was a bleak one. Gildas was right. How could such a people prosper? They started off well enough. The curious tale of Lucius and their conversion showed that Bede accepted that a proper beginning for Christianity in Britain was by papal mandate to a king. Having viewed the spread of the Pelagian heresy, Gildas' picture of British decadence and vice, the collapse of their society under the assaults of the pagan Saxons, was presented as God's final judgment. The coming of Augustine was marked by his first message to Ethelbert, which signified that they would come from Rome and brought a joyful message, which most undoubtedly assured to all that took advantage of it everlasting joys in heaven and a kingdom that would never end with the living and true God. For Augustine and for Bede, salvation and all its civilizing virtues came from the imperium of the Holy Roman Church. The letter written by Pope Gregory contains suitable allusions to the most pious Emperor Constantine's recovering the Roman Commonwealth from the perverse of idols. To Ethelbert's queen, Bertha, Gregory wrote, For as though through the memorable Helena, the mother of the most pious Constantine, Emperor of the Romans, the hearts of the Romans were kindled to the Christian faith, so by the zeal of your glory we are confident of the mercy of God is operating among the peoples of the Angles. Bede notes concerning Ethelbert, among other benefits which he conferred upon the race under his care, he established with the advice of his counsellors a code of laws after the Roman manner. Later, when Augustine admonished, admonished the bishops of the Britons to Catholic peace and unity, divine approbation for the Roman mission and its traditions was demonstrated by his working of a heavenly miracle. By contrast, when the pagan king Ethelfrith of Bernicia massacred the unarmed monks of Bangor and Scoed, who had assembled to aid the Britons by their prayers, it was seen as vengeance that pursued them for their contempt. It is known that Ethelbert exercised some dominance over neighbouring southern kings, Bede lists him as a third Anglo-Saxon overking, standing as godfather to the kings Sebert of Essex and Redward of East Anglia which Professor Michel, Mike, Michel Brown notes that his overlordship was vital in making inroads into certain areas of the patchwork of petty kingdoms which had been carved out by the Germanic migrants since they began arriving in Britain in greater numbers and which had assumed ascendancy over the native Romano British populace from around 550 onwards. The spirit of, in spite of setbacks, the process of conversion moved on, with the Isle of Wight being the last part of England to accept Christianity in 686. Much of the evangelism derived from the Gregorian mission, but of the late flowering of the insular church also played a significant role, especially in the north. Although the conversion of Northumbria is ascribed by Bede to Paulinus of York, there are alternative traditions ascribing the conversion of King Edwin to the Kimric hero Run Reifedfor, Roman of Great Wonder, he's called son of Urien, King of Reged. As a result of the exile of the Northumbrian royal family in Dalriata and possibly Ireland during the pagan interlude following the defeat of Edwin, 
King Oswald was baptised in Dalriata and later erected the bishopric of Lin at Lindisfarne, a daughter house of the great Columbanus community of Iona. Although there were cultural and liturgical differences, the Kingdom of Northumbria became the centre of collaboration between the two Christian traditions. And similarly, as I've mentioned earlier, in East Anglia, the Irish monk St. Thursey worked in parallel with St. Felix under obedience to Canterbury in converting East Anglia. In his account of the Synod of Whitby, Bede recalls the victory of the Roman party over the insular church with regard to the observance of Easter. After the learned debate among the differing traditions, the argument is finally swung by Abbot Wilfrid's assertion of the superiority of the Roman tradition. You and your companions, you certainly sin if having heard the decrees of the Apostolic See and of the Universal Church, that the same is confirmed by Holy Writ, you refuse to follow them. For though our fathers were holy, do you think their small number in a corner of the remotest island is to be preferred before the Universal Church of Christ throughout the world? If it marks the beginning of the triumph of the Roman Church, it also signals the manifestation of a Roman enmity which had previously only existed in incipient form, directed towards the Church. The Saxons, once converted to Christianity, take on the spirit of Romanitas with enthusiasm and gratitude to Gregory for his mission, which is demonstrated by continuing loyalty to the See of Rome. Far greater continuity may have existed between sub-Roman and Anglo-Saxon England than earlier historians have been willing to admit. The idea that the Anglo-Saxons, instead of either mixing with the people or else leaving them their own lands and parts of their lands, they always either killed or made slaves of all the people that they could find, does find little support in modern archaeological, linguistic, demographical or genetic scholarship. The image of indigenous Britons being subjected to either ethnic cleansing Bede's exterminare means driven out rather than destroyed in classical Latin, or merely driven to Britain's western extremities, has long been questioned. In 2004, a conference organised by the Manchester Centre for Anglo-Saxon Studies brought together archaeologists, place name specialists and other linguists, historians and geneticists who offered substantial evidence of real continuities between Roman Britain and the early Middle Ages. Under Edbert, King of Northumbria, a revival of 7th century northern imperial ambitions had evidently occurred among the Northumbrians. It was characterised by the harmony of church and state, especially as the king's brother, Egbert, was Archbishop of York for more than three decades. It was eulogised in the verse, So then Northumbria was prosperous, when king and pontiff ruled in harmony, one in the church and one in government, one wore the pool the Pope conferred on him, and one the crown his father's war of old, one brave and forceful, one devout and kind. They kept their power in brotherly accord, each happy in the other's sure support. Bede's history, finished in about 732, marks the golden period of Northumbrian prosperity. Peter Hunter Blair notes that while Bede did indeed live on the edge of the world, the reality of which was brought home to him by living just two and a half miles inside Hadrian's Wall, which formed the most northerly sector of the imperial frontier in the time of Diocletian. And Blair says something more about this. He says, Jerome, writing in his cell at Bethlehem, Paul and Anthony sharing their loaf of bread in the Egyptian desert, Augustine writing of the city of God in North Africa, Cassiodorus turning from the Italian civil service to the preservation of manuscripts in Calabria, Martin, born in Pannonia to become the soldier saint of Merovingian France, Isidore, the greatest scholar of Visigothic Spain, all these men, in their different ways and ages, however much they strove to withdraw from the classical world, were nonetheless heirs to a common imperial tradition which lived long after the death of Bede, even though its nature and strength became varied by continuing change and development. By the 8th century, the troubled liminal province of late antiquity had emerged as a Christian imperium in its own right. Under King Offa, the Mercy and supremacy reached its apogee, and his prestige was such that Charlemagne, soon to be emperor, addressed him as his respected and very dear brother when he entered into a trade treaty with him in 790. He also sent Offa and a number of English churches part of an Avar treasure hall, which we saw illustrated in, in Michelle's um, slides, um, and captured in 795 with a request for their prayers. 
Like Charlemagne, Offa had his son anointed king by bishops during his lifetime. And when Charlemagne proposed a marriage alliance between his son and one of Offa's daughters, it indicated his regard. However, Offa's counter-proposal that his heir, Ecthrith, could also marry one of Charlemagne's daughters proved a step too far, causing the proud Frank to break off diplomatic relations. Offa is praised for his piety and efforts to instruct his people in the precepts of God by Alcuin, the Northumbrian ecclesiastic, ecclesiastic attached to Charlemagne's court. Alcuin was a protégé of Archbishop Egbert of York and was recruited by Charlemagne to teach at the Palatine Academy in Arkham, where he taught the emperor, his sons, Pepin and Louis, and ladies of the court, the liberal arts, including rhetoric, dialectic, astronomy, and computers. Bringing from York his assistants Pytel, Sechworth, and Joseph, Alcuin revolutionised the educational standards of the academy and made a significant contribution to the Carolingian Renaissance. He was succeeded by Johannes Scotus Erugina, an Irish theologian, noted Greek scholar, scholar, Neoplatonist philosopher and poet. The reputation of this school and the Anglo-Saxon influence in the Carolingian Renaissance has long been recognised by historians of the early medieval period. Nor should we understand this as simply a brain drain from England, as Francian and Carolingian concepts also came to influence contemporary Anglo-Saxon culture. The 8th century, as we've heard partly also earlier, also saw missionaries from England spreading the faith to the pagans of the Carolingian Empire. Notable among them was the Northumbrian Willibald and Leguin Monk and Ripon, who carried the faith of the Frisians, as well as the Wessex evangelists St Boniface, Winfrith from Crediton, and the nun Leoba from Wimborne Minster, who converted the Germans. Tolkien, famous for Lord of the Rings, referred to their endeavours as one of the chief glories of England and ranks them among our chief contributions to Europe, considering all our history. Just as the Romano-British had suffered from the attacks of the pagan Anglo-Saxons, at the end of the 8th century, coastal assaults by pagan Vikings began and discovered rich plunder in the churches and monasteries. Lindisfarne and Bede's Monastery of Jarrow were among the first to fall in 793 and 794. Sacred vessels of gold and silver, jeweled shrines, costly robes, and valuables of all kinds were carried off. English people were captured and made slaves. Just as with the Anglo-Saxons' own ancestors, the Vikings began to settle until the Anglo-Saxon dynasties were overwhelmed or subjugated one by one. In 866, a Viking force marched north from East Anglia, took York and conquered southern Northumbria, and the following year Vikings moved on Nottingham, and the Mercians sued for surrender. In 869, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records that the army rode across Mercia into East Anglia and took winter quarters at Thetford, and that winter King Edmund fought against them, and the Danish took the victory and killed the king and conquered all that land. Only Wessex stood out among the English kingdoms. King Ethelred of Wessex and his brother Alfred fought off fierce onslaughts, but when Ethelred died in 880, the new King Alfred was forced to pay them off with Dengeld, the tribute, although this did not prevent their continuing assaults on his kingdom. In 878, Alfred counterattacked and defeated Guthrum, the Danish leader, at the Battle of Eddington. The significance of this was clearly seen by contemporaries as well as later historians. In the 11th century life of St Cuthbert, an apparition of the saint addresses Alfred before this battle in language similar to the Abrahamic covenant. To you and your sons is given the whole of Albion. Be just, for you are elected king of all Britain. The peace terms agreed required that Guthrum should convert to Christianity and that England should be divided between the Viking Dane law in the north and east, with Wessex holding the south and west. The once great kingdom of Mercia was now divided between Meth Wessex and the Dane law. Alfred's many reforms, which justly earned him the epithet the Great, included the fortification of several of the former Roman cities, London, Exeter, Chichester, Bath, Porchester, and Winchester, his capital. Although the Vikings were to remain a threat for a further two centuries, their progress had been haunted, halted, and the supremacy of Wessex led to a united and stronger English kingdom under the heirs of Alfred. Alfred the Great's commitment as a Christian king was demonstrated not only in his reforms of the church, but also in his devotion to the See of Rome. 
He was sent by his father, King Ethelwald, from pilgrimage to Rome as a child of five, when Pope Leo IV invested him with the insignia and robes of the consulate, seen as recognition of a future right, right to rule. As the Kingdom of Wessex expanded its influence, the style of the English kings also became imperial. Athelstan of Wessex, having obtained the submission of Constantine II, King of the Scots, and Owen of Strathclyde, adopted the style King and Chief of the whole realm of Albion. During the period reign of Athelstan's nephew, Edgar the Peaceful, his chief minister was the able reformer, St Dunstan, whom he appointed as Archbishop of Canterbury and sent to Rome to receive the pallium. Although at that time the Sea of Rome was caught between the threats of Berenger, King of Italy, and the rising influence of the German ruler Otto the Great, leading to the deposition of two popes, whilst the papacy languished under the corrupt dominance of the Crescenti family, the prestige of the Apostolic See was not diminished. Dunstan, as representative of Rome, bolstered by the strength and prestige of Edgar's patronage, demonstrated the beneficial symphony of church and state. Dunstan's former abbey at Glastonbury was granted the privilege of being received into the bosom of the Roman Church and the protection of the Blessed Apostles. Edgar had been crowned in 960 or 961, but following the model of King David, underwent a second unction at Bath in 973, after which he received the tribute of eight Celtic and Viking sub-kings, whose submission was symbolised by rowing him in state on the River Dee. In 970, he had adopted the regnal style, August Emperor of all Albion, Totius Albionus Imperator Augustus. And in the Charter of 974, this is expanded to all of Britain and of the neighbouring kings, Basilius. Some 560 years after the ending of imperial rule, an emperor and Augustus again reigned in Britain. The adoption of imperial titles, even of the Greek Basilius, pronounced both continuity with the past and equality with these, those other Roman emperors, the Armenian John I in Constantinople or the Saxon Otto the Great, reckoned as the real founder of the Holy Roman Empire. From outer orbis, Britain had now become a Christian imperium equal to both empires, contributing significantly to the development of Western Christianity under the aegis of the Imperium of the Holy Roman Church, which as heir of the ancient empire had conserved the spirit of Romanitas. After the lapse of another 560 years, however, history was to repeat itself as yet another tyrant, Henry VIII, reminiscent of those in Gildas, was to consolidate his rule by cutting adrift from Rome.